that one of the greatest forms of freedom is freedom from politics. The Sunflower Movement, which is half a million people on the street and many more online, um, participated in a non-violent demonstration occupying the parliament for three weeks uh, to not protest but rather show uh, what would it be like if you involved the entire society in a deliberation. The great thing about Polis is that if there's like 500 people, all very loud, but belaboring the same point, then it doesn't increase the area in Polis. It doesn't increase their statements ranking because instead of sorting by controversy by default, uh, on Polis it's sorting by bridge making by default. If you have that sort of a process and it search services some things as bridging and some things as divisive, both can be very beneficial because you don't take action on the divisive things, but you form community around the divisive things. So people can come out of the process learning both that they have new friends that they can ally with and that there's some things they can move forward on together. Welcome to Epicenter, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and people driving decentralization and the blockchain and revolution. I'm Friederike Ernst, and today I'm super honored to be here with Glenn Weil, the founder of Radical Exchange, and Audrey Tang, the first digital minister of Taiwan, who both wrote a book together, it's called Plurality, and uh, it's on the future of collaborative technology and democracy. Um, it's, it's a groundbreaking book that explores how digital tools can enhance um, democratic processes and foster a more inclusive and better society. Before we talk uh, with Glenn and Audrey, let me tell you about our sponsors this week. This episode is brought to you by Gnosis. Gnosis builds decentralized infrastructure for the Ethereum ecosystem. With a rich history dating back to 2015 and products like Safe, CowSwap, or Gnosis Chain, Gnosis combines needs-driven development with deep technical expertise. This year marks the launch of Gnosis Pay, the world's first decentralized payment network. With the Gnosis card, you can spend self-custody crypto at any visa accepting merchant around the world. If you're an individual looking to live more on chain or a business looking to white label the stack, visit GnosisPay.com. There are lots of ways you can join the Gnosis journey. Drop in the Gnosis DAO governance form, become a Gnosis validator with a single GNO token and low cost hardware, or deploy your product on the EVM compatible and highly decentralized Gnosis chain. Get started today at Gnosis.io. Cars One is one of the biggest node operators globally and help you stake your tokens on 45 plus networks like Ethereum, Cosmos, Celestia and DYDX. More than 100,000 delegators stake with Cars One, including institutions like BitGo and Ledger. Staking with Chorus 1 not only gets you the highest yields, but also the most robust security practices and infrastructure that are usually exclusive for institutions. You can stake directly to Chorus 1's public node from your wallet, set up a white label node, or use the recently launched product, Opus, to stake up to 8,000 ETH in a single transaction. You can even offer high yield staking to your own customers using their API. Your assets always remain in your custody, so you can have complete peace of mind. Start staking today at Chorus.one. So, welcome. Welcome to the podcast. It's super nice to have you on. Good local time. Very happy to be on the podcast. Delighted to be here again. It's been a few years. It has been a few years. So, I think both of you are pretty well known, so uh, I, I, will, I will venture um, a... An, introdu an introduction nevertheless. So, Audrey, you were Taiwan's first Minister of Digital Affairs. Um, you are a globally recognized digital pioneer. You have been relentlessly promoting transparency and um, in innovation, and you have played a pivotal role in Taiwan's digital democracy in initiatives. You are also widely known for your contributions to free software and kind of uh, for general advocacy in the digital space. And Glenn, you've been on before. And b back then, kind of, we talked about Radical Exchange, the book you had just released. You are a principal researcher at Microsoft Research. You are a rare breed in that you are both uh, an economist and a social technologist. Um, you have uh, worked extensively on radical markets, innovative governance models, and so on. 
the recurrent theme is um, kind of this uh, this uh, uh, is conversations on how technology can transform societal structures. And recently, you you co-wrote a book with a bunch of other people called Plurality. That was a very long introduction by our standards. So tell me about yourselves. How did you two meet? And what inspired you to actually write this book together? Uh, well, because of Radical Markets, I met Vitalik Buterin. We started working together. He introduced me to Audrey. Uh, we started working remotely with each other on some of the applications of ideas in Radical Markets in Taiwan, and then had the chance to meet in person together in Berlin, the same place we met you. Uh, and uh, that was an experience that kind of changed my life. Uh, Audrey, um, both who she is and what she was doing, really changed my perspective on many things. And my life started to sort of orient towards that over the coming years. And um, eventually, uh, I managed to kind of free myself from the role that I had at that time, which was fabulous and fascinating, but constraining in my ability to speak publicly. Uh, I was in the office of the CTO at Microsoft. And when I did, sort of the first thing I wanted to undertake was to write about in a more sort of analytic, crisp way with Audrey, um, the things that she has uh, done. And that's, um, was the genesis of the plurality. Book. Yeah. And when I uh, received the initial outline uh, of the book, uh, I was uh, just um, kind of wrapping up my work in the counter pandemic. Uh, which included, um, you know, mask provisioning and contact tracing, vaccination, all of that. Uh, and so the teams that I interacted with the most uh, during the pandemic, uh, we decided to bind them together. So whether it's universal services, um, spectrum allocation, uh, platform economy, um, department of cybersecurity, data pipelines, and so on, uh, we decided to just bind them over into a single ministry called the Ministry of Digital Affairs. Um, and so it is kind of a blank canvas, uh, and Taiwan never had such a dedicated um, digital ministry with such in all encompassing roles. So in a sense, uh, Glenn's outline of the fundamental human rights uh, that we should guarantee on the internet from a human right perspective of not individuals, but rather uh, associated individuals and groups, as well as this idea of plurality or collaboration across diversity became kind of the blueprint of the Ministry of Digital Affairs that was in 2022. Wow. There, there's a lot of information here. So we we, we know you both knew Vitalik. Uh, so then because you had co-written your previous book with him. Um, how, how did you meet him, Audrey? Oh, no, I did not co-write my previous book with Vitalik. I wrote it with Eric Posner. But Vitalik uh, sort of oh, picked sorry. up on that book. And a big part of its reception in the world became because of his interest in it and the things we built based on it together. So it's it's not literally true that we wrote it together, but he did end up writing the preface for the for the paperback edition. So uh, sorry, it's kind of like quadratic voting and kind of Haberger taxes and so on. They they are just they are just in my brain. They are very tightly connected to Vitalik. I'm sorry for the mis misattribution here. <laughs> it's actually very funny because recently uh, some several people have come up to me and said, "Have you heard about this idea from Vitalik Buterin called quadratic voting?" And uh, I was like, <laughs> I actually heard about that quite a while well before Vitalik uh, heard about it, but I'm delighted that you heard about it now as well. So well, we kind of preempted this uh, dynamic in this particular book by relinquishing the copyright. So plurality.net is entirely in the public domain. So it doesn't matter if you take a couple of paragraphs and say it's your work. Yeah, uh, so, but, so attribute it to whoever you want to attribute it. Exactly. Yes. Yes. Unless you attribute it uh, uh, to yourself and kind of uh, you, you get done in for, for plagiarism, which uh, is uh, uh, always a very r real danger in academia. <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 the whole point of, of public domain really is um, that the ideas uh, are the protagonists. We are mm -hmm. just the vehicles, uh, the vessels right, yeah. that inhabit those ideas. B before we go into the ideas, that kind of form core of, of your new book. Audrey, let's talk about you for a little while, because I, I think it's, it's exceedingly rare that kind of people who kind of, I would classify as kind of like hackers in some sense, actually go into government, right? So I think this is, this is something that, um, because working with governments often 
very bureaucratic and frustrating. Um, h- how did you end up in this very unique position of third, first digital minister? But first of all, it is not that rare in Taiwan to have actual <laughs> experts as ministers. My successor, the current digital minister, is not just IEEE fellow, but also a expert in privacy enhancing technologies and zero knowledge and all sort of uh, the cutting edge things. So uh, I think that the point I'm making is that um, Taiwan had a long history uh, of working to think of democracy as a social technology, not as a like 200 year tradition. Well, we only had our first presidential election in 96. So at that time already the war I web is part of the conversation. Now, as for me personally, um, I've uh, worked as a reverse mentor, a young person younger than 35 um, to advise cabinet ministers in 2014. And the reason why I was involved uh, was that in 2014, the administration was enjoying uh, a 9% trust rate uh, from the citizens uh, because of its opaqueness handling a trade deal with the Beijing regime, uh, the CSSTA, the Cross Trade Service Trade Agreements. Now, and so the Sunflower Movement, which is half a million people on the street and many more online, um, participated in a nonviolent demonstration occupying the parliament for three weeks uh, to not protest, but rather show uh, what would it be like if you involve the entire society in a deliberation about this trade deal with a lot of facilitation, a lot of live streaming and all the cutting edge technologies at the time. Uh, so because of the demo was successful at the end of three weeks, the head of the parliament essentially said, okay, if that's what people want, we'll just ratify it. So it was one of those very rare successful occupies. And so the cabinet members then tapped us, the young uh, facilitators and so on, to serve as reverse mentors. And I worked with them for two years, always saying that I'm working with the government, not for the government, uh, with the people, not just for the people, um, before being, I guess, promoted uh, into a minister myself two years after that. That was in 2016. So, I mean, you travel the world a lot. Do you feel that um, the democratic... Especially um, now. Uh, she It was harder for her to travel before, but now it's uh, easier. So. Yeah, I, I've just been in like seven European cities and now in South America. <laughs> um, do, do you feel that the democratic tradition, or I mean, it's not that much of a tradition because as you said, it's not been around for all that long, but do you think it markedly differs from Western Europe or the or North America? Well, I would say that I was just in Finland, uh, and there's a lot of similarities, I would say, uh, in the sense that um, it is not about polarization. It is not about like us versus them. It is more about a matter that everybody thinks together uh, and a high trust now in Taiwan uh, in the institutional capability um, to think beyond polarization, to co-create. So I would classify Taiwan's democracy as uh, embracing the conflict. So whenever people see a incoming conflict, instead of thinking that half of the population is against this and half of the population is for it, um, it we're usually about creating a space where those new found conflicts and so on can be tapped into energy. So one metaphor I usually use is that we have a lot of earthquakes because we're caught between the tectonic plates of uh, Eurasian on one part and Pacific plate on the other. But because we have very good resilience in our building codes, each earthquake actually pushed the tip of Taiwan a little bit upward um, toward the sky, so to speak. So to make a more synthetic way of looking at things. Whereas I would say in many more fossilized democracies, people feel that it, they have to wait for four years uh, to make a change. And you see a lot of this flip-flopping, like one side takes it and four years later, the other side wins and four years later, the other side wins and so on. There's less of this dynamic co-creation potentials. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I would say this is definitely, definitely the case uh, in Germany where I'm from. And Glenn, I, I, I'm sure you would agree it's most definitely uh, the case in your native U.S. as well. Except I'm also a German citizen, so uh, both are native to you me are. and both oh, have fantastic. similar I issues. I had no idea. Yes. Fantastic. Um, yeah, but h- how do you create this atmosphere where people kind of start creating together rather than kind of entering this tribal thing where kind of it becomes about kind of like 
identity uh, identity and kind of how you identify and kind of who who's wrong and uh, who's wrong and who's right on a very primal level yeah i think uh, a lot of the recent polarization can be traced uh into this uh like button and the share button and the retweet button nowadays called the repost button uh because uh a lot of those buttons do is to surface to the front only the viral ideas that puts people into a very quick impulsive action of clicking you know like or uh, retweet and so on and so in taiwan in 2014 uh, we observed as part of the sunflower movement that the social media is somewhat anti-social in the sense that it manufactures counter power very easily but it doesn't build bridges easily so we decided to build uh, or adapt our own pro-social versions of social media. So uh, at the Sunflower Movement, we tapped into a lot of co-creative tools. Um, at the time, Hackpad, Lumio, and so on. Many of them are not uh, even around anymore. Hackpad became part of uh, Dropbox and so on. But one thing stayed, uh, which is the ability to create a toolkit of bridge-making pro-social social media. So one example is this system called Polis, which we deployed in 2015. Um, the idea is that you can be pro Uber, you can be pro taxi, you can be pro this or that. But on this social media, you can post your comments for other people to like or unlike. But there's no reply button and there's no retweet button. So there's no way to dunk on each other. Um, the only way to get viral, so to speak, or visible is if you propose a statement that was also liked by the people who are unlike you. So the more that you unify, the more bridge you build, the more visibility your ideas get. And people see uh, very clearly how the different islands are and how they're brought together by ideas, for example, that you know raising prices is fine during a price surge, but undercutting existing meter isn't fine, or that insurance is important. And so it's so a very nuanced, very eclectic ideas. And we honor the top 10 ideas by reading them out to the multi-stakeholder meeting and have the minister deciding a law uh, based on those crowdsourced uh, agenda. And so giving voice to those bridge makers has always been the core idea, collaboration across difference. And we're very happy now that the community nodes of X.com previously, Twitter, or now it is YouTube and so on are all picking up on those ideas. Yeah, super cool. I, I kind of, I want to go into the Polis thing in just a bit. I just wanted to ask, there was um, a short story on the internet a couple of years ago, maybe like five or 10 years ago. Um, it was called Sword by Controversial. I'll put it in the show notes. I'll send it to you guys later. So basically, um, it's it's um, this idea that um, it's a short story. So basically, it's it's it kind of comes across as kind of like a comment on social media or Reddit or something where someone describes that they worked at a social media company and they had made a startling discovery, um, namely that there is such a thing as scissor statements. So basically, statements that you can craft such that they kind of divide the pop population into more or less um, equal sized um, chunks um, and half of it will agree with it vehemently and the other half will kind of um, find the notion of that statement utterly abhorrent. So kind of like there's no middle ground at all. Um, and kind of they, they they kind of they mention examples of kind of like where this was dropped and kind of it, it's it's um, it's kind of like it's like this conspiracy leaning thing where where um, kind of governments use them to kind of cover up things that are really going things that's really going on and so on and to a certain extent I actually think the the author actually picked up on something that actually really does happen so it feels like there's a lot of manufactured conflict out there mm. oh yeah definitely yes there's actually very clear research on this you don't need to uh, you know, use a hypothetical. Molly Roberts, uh, Gary King, and Jen Pan have a wonderful article showing that the most effective, and in many cases in their sample of research at least, primary uh, approach of the Chinese government is not censorship. It instead is the manufacturing of scissors statements in context when collective organizing might otherwise occur. So that uh, the group that might organize is distracted and divided against itself 
by the scissor statement. It's uh, what we call polarization attack or mass distraction or whatever, yes. What you guys kind of advocate for is kind of like this um, this culture of kind of like bringing everyone together um, at the same table and kind of just surfacing the differences to kind of make sure that kind of a compromise can be reached that kind of that honors everyone that everyone's equally unhappy or happy with um how how do you but how do you actually get to that stage how do you actually get people to the same table i wouldn't say that it's uh trying to get people equally unhappy or equally happy i would say that it's coming up with something we can all live with uh so the difference here is that it's not trying to reach a conclusion or a decision, but just some lower hanging fruits that let people see that after all, we think similarly as our neighbors on some very basic things, right? So for example, um, we uh, sent um, 200,000 SMS uh, in my previous job as digital minister uh, to random numbers in Taiwan. Uh, so anyone who with a phone has a chance to get a SMS number from 111, which is a recognized government-only number, uh, and of course, contain with it a survey uh, asking, what do you think about information integrity online? What do you think about it? Defakes and cheap fakes and fraud and whatever, right? So the idea here is not for us to come up with a preset um, compromise positions and ask people to pick their position. Uh, the idea really is to ask people, how do you feel? about the current situation. And there's far more potential for overlap, for feelings instead of solutions. And then after that, uh, we chose uh, through random stratified sampling, 450 people that are statistically representative of the Taiwanese population uh, and randomly assigned 10 uh, people into the same room. So for 45 rooms of 10 people each, and they just deliberate it, just have a conversation. Um, and there's no facilitator. The room is the facilitator. So it nudges people who don't speak. Uh, it allows interruption but just for five seconds. It knows the common points, but also knows the points of differences, make a whole transcript and all that. But the end result is very, very nuanced. It is not getting people to a place where they all agree 100%. But most people actually agreed, for example, that if you uh, are a large advertisement platform that reaches more than 10% of Taiwanese people and you have advertisement, but you do not do KYC like digital signature or whatever, so that you open up to scammers uh, to con people using deepfakes, then if somebody get con for $1 million, you probably should be liable for that $1 million. So what this technology does is that it gets into this very compressed but not lossy compression, very nuanced positions that can go straight into a law. It's actually already in the parliament now. And uh, to your question of why people participate, well, because it's effective. It is much more effective than waiting for four years. And also we pay people some, I don't know, 100 US dollars for their um, time to participate in this process. I, you know, the thing I'd also say is, uh, I, I think that scissor statements aren't good or bad. It all depends on context. In fact, it's great to expose people to the scissor statements in the context of understanding this is something that would divide the population. Here's a set of people who would like it. Here's who not. There's also other things that would, you know, uh, not divide the population. You know, the way I think about this is uh, we're very grateful to the, you know, Chinese communists for the, you know, party. They did great research, uh, just like medical research. You can do the research and you can find the vaccine or you can spread the disease, right? And so we just believe in spreading the vaccine, which is that you, you give a little bit of it at low volume to a large population rather than injecting a very large amount of it at a very high volume to a small population. Right? right. You make it a social object so people can talk around the fact that there is this division in our society, but you do not amplify that division itself. It is similar to an mRNA vaccine, just as Glenn said. Yeah, or, or with you know, my, my children, it's actually great for my children to have intense emotions and to reflect on those emotions and understand how those emotions affect them. It's not so great for them just to completely experience without any reflection those emotions that get lost in them, right? Yeah, I, I, I totally hear that. If you kind of look at these Taiwanese examples of these deliberative um, processes, 
I, I kind of I hear you say that it's a representative sample of of society. Kind of when we go to social media, where kind of a lot of kind of like this um, these echo chambers exa exist, I feel it's very much not a um, a faithful representation of society. It's kind of just very few people who are very loud. Um, do, do you think there's a way of kind of like tuning that down as a society and kind of giving more um, giving more weight to the to the quieter people yeah i think so i mean part of the design of polis which by the way isn't just used in taiwan i was in finland and finland have this uh what do finland think conversation that has almost a million votes on polis bigger than any taiwanese polis single yeah it's bigger than any taiwanese polis uh examples and uh, the most divisive point by the way in finland uh a year ago uh was the statement that says Nowadays, you can't say the words like jokes or whatever as you could anymore without offending someone, end of quote. Uh, and so, which uh, really portrays, you know, uh, the new generation, maybe in the past five years or so on, uh, the awareness of how words can offend or trigger people. So that's uh, their divisive points. Anyway, but my point being, uh, the great thing about Polis is that if there's like 500 people all very loud, but belaboring the same point. Then it doesn't increase the area in Polis. It doesn't increase their statements ranking because instead of sorting by controversy by default, uh, on Polis it's sorting by bridge making by default. So if 500 people make essentially the same point over and over again, they're really in this very small area uh, and there's no bridge to be made. And therefore um, it's not visible at all. Uh, on the scoreboards. The scoreboard only highlights really the ones uh, that bridges across large divides, which is difficult to come by. So the idea of a bridging bonus or just changing the sorting algorithm by default gives uh, the voice to the quieter people. And if you're uh, the quieter people that doesn't think in a mainstream way, it creates a island of people that is quite uh, distant from the majority uh, clusters. But it also means if people manage to bridge your view with theirs, then the bridging bonus is actually larger. And you see this dynamic in polis, in community notes, and nowadays in YouTube notes as well. And by the way, I don't think there's anything wrong, and polis does allow it, for those uh, divisive things to exist. It's just that just by screaming louder, they shouldn't be the only thing that gets seen. It shouldn't amplify by uh, getting more uh, louder exactly. and screaming it, yeah. So we've talked about polis quite a bit. Maybe let's kind of dig into what that is. So kind of like in my understanding, polis is um, this clustering algorithm that kind of takes things into n-dimensional space where kind of you have n statements and everyone says yes, no to the statements. And then, then it kind of clusters you in that, it clusters people in that n-dimensional space. So kind of it shows which opinions kind of cluster together and um, where um, where different clusters kind of actually meet is that more or less that's more or less an it. okay descri uh, and, description yes yes uh and it's coupled with a visualization like a group selfie uh that's dynamically updated so that people can see what new uh divisions are being formed uh the uh, mathematical term is uh a dimensional reduction so that you can always see what are the like two most divisive uh, points that currently separates people apart. Yeah, the way I, one way I think about it is there there was a regime in the United States that's very famous and often hearkened back to called the Fairness Doctrine and the Hutchins Commission. And the idea of these was very simple. It was that what media was required to do was surface and report as news things that people generally would agree on. And for anything that was not like that, they had to show the different sides of the debate. Right. And, and so, and, and Polis is just right. a way of doing that. Right. So, like the facts that people agree on, the common facts, um, the divides. So, take one, take two. Uh, and also, not confuse the facts with opinions. So, what do you feel? So, your own feelings about it. So, it's these four different segments. This, this is a very simple thing to do, but it used to be very expensive to do this and require a lot of gatekeeping and top down and whatever. And Polis is just a way to like cheaply do that in a social media environment rather than have the social media environment be curated by some other set of principles that applied before the Hutchins Commissions were, which was called yellow journalism, where you take the thing that is most divisive and you, and, and basically we 
the U.S. moved from one regime to the other, and, and poll is just a way to move social media in the same way. But basically, for that to work, you actually have to agree on the facts first, right? No, no, because they get surfaced by the algorithm as there's no prior definition of facts. Facts are the things. That facts are the things that people all agree on and agree that other people agree on. Exactly. Okay, and basically, if 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 there's too little com common ground, so kind of, I mean, because kind of like, I think this is something that kind of we have all noticed over the last couple of years that there there are there's now a very significant number of people who kind of deny obviously true fac facts. Well, I, I mean, it depends on how you see the, the conversation. Uh, I remember at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, there were a lot of different takes, different um, scientific opinions even about the efficacy of masks. But one of the communication statements that we push out in the early 2020 uh, was a very cute dog, a Shiba Inu, putting the paw on her face saying, wear a mask to protect your own mouth against your dirty unwashed hand. Um, so, I, I mean, for that, people generally agree on because it doesn't talk about virus or aerosol or whatever. It's mostly mask as a, you know, hand washing reminder. Um, and so I think it's called overlapping consensus. You can almost always find some lower hanging fruits like that, that people maybe laugh at it, maybe it's humorous, but at the end of the day, nobody really seriously dispute that. And, and by the way, you know, let's take about as divisive an, an issue as it gets, the Israel-Palestine situation. Community notes contrary to what many people would think, has actually been enormously valuable in that situation. Of course, there are many notes that get posted that are very opinionated that don't make it out. But a, a community notes has played a huge role in debunking a huge range of things, because there are a range of just verifiable things uh, using what people in this audience might call the blockchain, but other people would just call timestamps, you know, uh, that, that just can show that certain things are not true. And there, there's a wide range of things where community notes has played a key role. In yes, so I think it's the stickness, right? In polis, you cannot unsee the bridges. In community notes, you cannot unsee the top notes that is posted along with the tweet. You, you literally can't take it down. Um, and so when people become in that context aware that there are some things that are bridge making, then they cannot think anymore that we live in a post-fact world. I actually love the approach of community notes. Um, so, and the way that I'm, I'm not sure whether everyone's familiar with it, but the way that it kind of works under the hood is that kind of if someone posts a community note, then uh, then kind of like you can opt into kind of seeing it first and kind of upvoting or downvoting it. But basically, if uh, people who have very different um, social media patterns actually upvoted, it gets a lot more visibility rather than kind of if like uh, 10,000 people who do the exact same things and like the exact same things upvoted, then kind of that, that gets seen much, much less than kind of if it's a diverse crowd. Is that fair? Right. It's the same bridging bonus. It's actually inspired by Polis. Yeah. Super, super nice. Yeah. You, you guys have many, many examples of kind of these, uh, um, these, collaborative technologies and kind of um, how to um, how to um, use them to aid um, this notion of digital pluralism. But I kind of I also want to talk about kind of how you see kind of like Web3 playing into this. So and f for that kind of I actually want to start super sim simply kind of how would you yourself kind of de define Web3? What does it mean to you? Oh, um, so as you know, I18N is just a shorthand for internationalization. So to me, Web3, all lowercase with no space, Web3 is just a shorthand for decentralized. Uh, so whenever I see decentralized, and I don't want to type that many letters, I just write Web3. How do you think we can use um, Web3 technologies to kind of leverage for outcomes you would like to see in kind of the, the democracy and collaborative arena. Well, let me let me give you an example of a tool, but conceived in a very different way. So, like the default imagination for many people of what a Web three technology is is like Bitcoin, like a like a open, public, fi fully financialized blockchain. But here's something that uses two Web three technologies to build something very different, 
Imagine that we have a group of people and they all uh, are exchanging messages or maybe even payments or something like this. Um, and all of the messages are on a shared ledger, but it's protected by a designated verifier proof. That is, uh, the only people who can have confidence that the message was sent correctly are people who are part of that community. So that is a distributed ledger and a zero knowledge technology put together to create something that's actually almost completely opposite to the notion of a financialized public blockchain, because that group of people is the only people who can know what's on it. And they, it can't be permissioned by a global financial value. It's permissioned by some social certificate of that community. So I think, you know, tools can be very useful, but they can be used in a variety of different ways. Yeah. Uh, and uh, in my previous job, uh, when we faced unprecedented uh, denial of service attack in 2022 um, on our uh, websites, um, we uh, went to this technology called IPFS, uh, Interplanetary File System, uh, and we use it just as a super CDN uh, where people can just pin our website at ipns uh, colon slash slash moda.gov.tw to keep us afloat. Uh, so that when people, even in very low connection um, capabilities, want a copy of the official websites and communications and so on, um, they can actually go ahead and do it without relying on any centralized CDN systems. Now, of course, we would still use Cloudflare and many other CDN solutions, but having the ability for people to participate and through participating, verifying that we have not tempered um, the official website. That is actually very, very useful uh, because that means the code um, is all on JavaScript, is all on the front end. We have nothing to hide. When we publish um, my, you know, transcripts of lobbyist visits or interviews or whatever, it lives on your computer too. And you can verify that I have not tempered with it uh, because tempering with it will change the content addressable hash code. Again, uh, I don't own Filecoin. This is not a cryptocurrency application, but it wins trust by trusting the people. Okay, so I kind of what, what I hear is transparency. How do you guys feel about co-ownership because that's another thing that kind of like web3 technology enables at its core right so kind of like when you're on the internet today um most of the value you accrue you actually accrue to the same five companies do you think kind of we can turn this thing around um by leveraging um decentralized technology well i, I think glenn's example is actually co-ownership uh the ownership is around the integrity of the context so in a group of five, only these five people own the contextual integrity. And for anyone outside of that group, uh, anyone has deniability, right? Uh, if you get a screenshot or whatever, it, it really doesn't work that way, right? So I think ownership is not meant for me as something that is necessarily about the financial value of things that you can sell or things like that. It's more like the collaborative governance that people would not exceed the expectations of each other so that we co-own this context, but we not necessarily assign monetary value to it. Yeah, I think um, there are many different ways to conceptualize co-ownership. And I think that often in some Web3 communities, the only way to think about that is financialized. And like there, there are some limited use cases where financialized ways of thinking about things are, are the right way to approach them. But uh, I would argue that that's actually a very simplistic way. There's, the, you know, it's kind of choosing one out of a million and then putting all the focus on that one, uh, which really is kind of an edge case that you might want to use in a very limited set of set contexts. Um, so I think that that may be the mistake is that to take a good idea like co-ownership and then assume that it means, you know, monetary, financialized, fungible, blah, blah, blah. I would subscribe to that. And I think kind of, to me, the monetary element is just as much about not f not um, feeding the man in a way. So kind of not actually by, by kind of being on Twitter, which is the, the only social media platform I'm actually on, uh, but to, to not kind of accrue all that value that I create to um, Elon Musk. I'd much rather kind of have it go back to the to the entirety of the Twitter usership, 
rather than and I and I think kind of the this um, hyper financialization where kind of you, you kind of you know the price of everything and kind of there's like a token behind everything and so on. I think yeah, that's obviously that's a misstep. I think it's kind of just because people love to speculate, right? I mean, people love number go up, but um, the the fact that you can actually create something that is legitimately co-owned by tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands or millions of people, I think this is fundamentally new, right? Well, I mean, I, I'm not sure I would say it's uh, all new, but it's made, it could, can be made more efficient. So um, there's uh, old literature and sociology that is all about different symbolic media. So uh, money is one, voting is another. These are two ways that we take sort of inputs from people and then allocate something based on them. But there are many others. There's like the way that if you've worked at a particular restaurant that you might be able to work at another restaurant later in another country. And, or there's the way in which if you've written a paper and it got certain kinds of citations, that that might enable you to get a job at a university, which might let you write other papers. Like all of these are different uh, maybe imperfectly or in incompletely articulated mathematical functions that take various kinds of inputs and turn them to outputs. You know, there's a game Civilization VI or Civilization in general where there's many different media. There's like faith and there's money and there's like scientific, re whatever. And like, I think that's a very nice like simplistic model of the notion that like, yeah, there can be many currencies, but they're not all like exchangeable in the same ways. They can be used to do different types of things. And I think that's existed forever. You know, that, that's the way that most things work. It's just a very easy thing to talk about money. And because it's easy to talk about, it gets talked about more, but it's not actually like that runs most things in the world. And so I think the misstep that we've taken is taken the simplest, easiest to describe thing, not the most useful, not the most relevant, not the most helpful thing, and only tried to describe that one thing. Which other things do you think are helpful to look to look at in this context? Well, I, I mean, community notes is a really good example because it's a open source decentralized thing, right? Vitalik set up his own node, uh, a verifier node, a validation node of community notes. Um, so it can conceptually exist in a separate layer uh, that is not tied to x.com as seen uh, recently by the YouTube uh, adopting something like that, right? So uh, I think um, a, a community node layer uh, on the entire social network. It is something that we can imagine already now uh, in a decentralized way. Um, and because I already said that I just abbreviate decentralized to Web3, so I would say that it's a Web3 layer then uh, around um, social media. And that, I think, uh, addresses one of the over-concentrated uh, nexus of power, exactly as you said, uh, that my posts, my accounts, and so on, x.com, um, should not be simply for somebody's taking if I somehow want to exchange community notes uh, across the Fediverse or across many other interoperable protocols. I mean, just, just to give you a very simple example, you can imagine that there's a person, like three people, all of whom have made the same amount of money. One is like a social entrepreneur who's involved in lots of big world causes. A second person is someone who works at a very standard company and spends most of their time with their family. And a third person is a local industrialist who's done great things for a town, but is not widely known outside of that. I mean, all these people might have made the same amount of money, but the types of social roles that we would want to place this person into are radically different, right? Um, like the first person might be a good candidate for like a UN leadership role or to be on television, you know, in a global way. The the second person might, you know, reasonably have a good degree of material comfort, but it's not someone you'd want to really be in a social leadership role. And the third person is someone who might be a very good mayor for a local community, but probably not in either of the other two roles, right? And so clearly, and, and that's like, that doesn't require any moving away from our, like that's just true in our society. But the problem is our money systems don't capture that. Like you you need to read a biography of the person and run advertisements. Or that's a very inefficient way to gather that information. So on the one hand, we have this very efficient thing called money that captures very little. It really just doesn't tell us about most of what we care about. And then we have these very inefficient things that are capturing more with social richness. So like why rather than just like doing the very easy and I think kind of stupid task of making money, like, you know, 
go more and more places and faster and faster. Why don't we try to take some of these things that are totally inefficient and try to find some way to capture them better so they can scale a bit more? So, so that that would kind of uh, take the form of kind of like um, some sort of reputation score, social graph, or how how, how would you kind of envisage that? Yeah, I mean, like in the book, we have uh, quite a lot of description of a range of different algorithms like this. But, you know, like one simple example uh, of this kind of thing is um, the recovery of a key. So you might want to recover your key and you might want to give some guardians that let you recover your key. Uh, but you might want these guardians to be diverse relative to your social graph, which is to say you might want to choose five guardians who the only point of social connection is through you uh, because then it makes it almost impossible for them to collude with you like almost any way that they would try to collude with each other would have to go through like either contacting you or like someone who's a very close friend of yours so that's a very secure way um that is based on a reputation but not based on a reputation that's like this person is good and this person is bad which is just as stupid as money reduces everything to one dimension instead it's based on an understanding of the social context of these people and the notion that when it comes to being your form of security, it should be something that connects only through you rather than through other routes. Yeah, that's that's super interesting. And I personally have thought about recovery a lot because uh, I, I started a, a project called Gnosis Safe. It's kind of an Ethereum wallet, a multi-sig wallet. And um, we, we once did a survey among users kind of asking them kind of, how they would choose guardians to kind of for key recovery, and there, the, the thing that we heard most often was um, that in principle they would kind of love to take people like from their real lives, kind of their sisters or brothers, or fathers, best friends, and so on. Um, but they don't want to do that because their balance is visible. So kind of like anyone who kind of who who would be who would be a guardian to their account could could immediately see how much funds they actually have on that address, which I thought was, um, so kind of, we thought about kind of like, how would you choose them so they wouldn't collude with each other and so on. And this wasn't people's concern at all. Like almost no one actually brought that up. So uh, I, and I think kind of, I mean, obviously those are kind of like things we will, uh, we will move past kind of once we have uh, better privacy on chain and so on but in principle it kind of i think it kind of shows how important it is to kind of like to to, to speak with people to see what what it actually is that it that bothers them so um yeah very interesting i'm not sure how into kind of web3 governance uh, you guys are but it's terrible so kind of like despite the fact that kind of we often say that um leveraging decentralization for better governance is kind of where we want to go and kind of how we want to leverage this technology. Actually, Web3 governance is terrible. So kind of there's this continuous uphill battle of low voter turnout and voter fatigue and kind of attention as the scarce resource and so on. And I think in some some way it actually makes sense because um, kind of like in a way democracies are also just very convoluted algorithms um, and yeah they, they could probably do with um, uh, a little refactoring but in principle a lot of parts are there for a reason um, and kind of actually <laughs> making people vote on almost everything is not a very scalable way of kind of like running any sort of operation. Do, do you think it kind of it it will require a more orchestrated push to kind of get some of these things we already know work in kind of like traditional democracies um, into this decentralized world, or do you think kind of we should continue doing what we're doing now, which is mostly kind of like very kind of like evolutionary in terms of its you know algorithms just starting from scratch and making it marginally um, more complex here and more complex there and kind of adding to it rather than kind of replicating things that are already there. I mean, Hannah Arendt famously said that one of the greatest forms of freedom is freedom from politics. Um, because most people don't, you know, want to spend too many evenings working on socialism. And so the question <laughs> is, 
how can you make it very easy for people to express the things that really matter to them and not impose on them to do everything else that they don't care about? For example, uh, you might think I'm a very politically sophisticated person. I'm involved in these global issues. I have no idea about local politics where I live. Uh, and I really wish I could uh, give that over to people in my community who are knowledgeable, but with some things that I feel distinctively. So we need to design ways that make it possible for people to do that, to make it possible for people to opt into participation without the converse of that, which is that, of course, then the most interested people can get too much of a voice. And that's uh, a lot of the problem of, of designing these things is taking those issues seriously and designing systems expecting that that is part of the design rather than thinking that we just want some sort of idealized, simplified model uh, that and the thing that performs best in that case. Yeah, and I also think it's far easier uh, to look at one statement from your fellow citizen and say, I feel this way or I don't feel this way, um, which is the polis way. Uh, or to be in the room of a video chat of nine fellow citizens uh, and just listen what they're feeling and share your own feeling. In both of these modalities, um, it, you get to know viewpoints, you know new people, and there is no kind of decision-making burden on you, like you're the final arbiter, you're the final referendum caster or things like that. It's much more exploratory. And very interestingly, uh, we have discovered earlier in the process uh, of a decision making, the more you ask people in the exploratory way, in the discovery, in the agenda setting way, the more interest they have uh, in learning because they get something out of it. They, they get love, actually, <laughs> uh, community love, that is to say, they get to know, know more people. And the more you're finally at a point where you have to count the votes, uh, you have to make the final decision, for a referendum and so on, uh, the less uh, agency one have on it, because at the end of the day, um, half of the people will feel they have lost or something like that, right? So I think uh, the earlier the engagement is, the lower the threshold it is, and the more like psychological support uh, we provide in the context of just learning about each other, of a learning circle of sorts, the more likely that people will see governance as something that they participate for fun or for um, communal interest, but instead of just for the decision itself. And that can happen for both the divisive and the bridging things, because if you have that sort of a process and it services some things as bridging and some things as divisive, both can be very beneficial because you don't take action on the divisive things, but you form community around the divisive things. So people can come out of the process learning both that they have new friends that they can ally with and that there's some things they can move forward on together. In principle, um, and I'm 100% on board, I mean, these methods um, that you describe, they've been around for 10, 15 years or so. Um, wh why aren't they more widely adopted um, by nation states and other decision-making bodies at this point? Well, because facilitation and summarization uh, are very, very costly. They require special training. Taiwan's uh, used to be youth ministry. Nowadays, the youth administration have a whole program that's been running for more than 10 years to train the facilitators and the summarizers. And even with the best trained ones, I've worked with some of them. If you hit, say, 150 people, there's a limit to how much they can facilitate and summarize. Um, but nowadays, uh, the cost is rapidly decreasing. As I mentioned, there are now technologies that can uh, not just turn speech to text, but actually take the nonverbal cues um, in language models, multimodal models. And that does a summarization that doesn't feel like forced, that compresses but without losing nuanced. And that does the facilitation, I would argue, better than many of the best facilitators that I have met. So just a combination of natural language processing technologies and the recent uh, language models, multimodal process, made the cost essentially zero. It's like uh, before Open Whisper and after Open Whisper when it comes to speech recognition. Uh, and so I think this is really the year where we're seeing a lot more uh, interest 
by investing into the digital participation infrastructure as infrastructure without the prohibiting cost of human facilitation as summarization. I, I also think, you know, it's always much easier and requires much less ma imagination to use some new tool to just, uh, you know, very rapidly reduce the cost or automate things that are actually happening, but it doesn't accomplish very much. In fact, you don't even see very much productivity gains from that kind of thing. Whereas the much harder work is to actually get people to change social practices along with the technology. Um, that Because that requires cultural imagination. It requires actually involving people in the process of the change. And I think that's where you're going to see much broader productivity gains, much bigger transformation, not by the way that AI is usually talked about, but actually the way that's hard to talk about AI because it requires people to think about it a little bit. So it, it, it moves slowly and it repairs things rather than moving fast and breaking things. Uh, but it, it can actually bring a lot deeper change, a lot more, I would say, even economic as well as more importantly, social growth. So there are the fast changes that are happening because of the low cost, and there are deeper, scaling deeply, changes yeah. that are happening also. Can you describe the role of a human facilitator? So what do they do and kind of how, I think kind of becoming more of a facilitator for each, well, to each and every one of us. I mean, often people go into a confrontative mode where really they don't have to. Do you think these skills that kind of you teach those people in the facilitator academies, do they transfer uh, to kind of like general life? Yeah, they do. I mean, there are different schools, right? But they all revolve around this idea of like nonviolent communication, focused conversation methods to ensure that people speak to word, uh, something we can all live with instead of winning at a moment and controlling 100% uh, of things, right? So it is um, a lot about uh, the everyday um, practice of listening of listening actively, uh, listening with care, listening without taking one side over the other, but listening to both sides or all the sides and so on. So yes, practicing facilitation, even though in the age of AI makes you a better person uh, in everyday life as well. It's a general skill uh, that transfers to life. But what I was saying was that it is also something that this um, current uh, generation of language model uh, also does very well. If you ask any uh, language model that is pre-trained in the past year or so to facilitate a conversation like Audrey Tang, it actually does a very good job. Fantastic, I will definitely try that. So what can, what can listeners do to contribute to a more pluralistic digital future? Well, uh, you know, we in the book, we lay out a whole range of things from like the easiest, simplest, short-term you know, retweet, et cetera, to the longest, you know, most in investment. But, it, you know, we would certainly encourage everyone to read the book, to check out the trailer of the film about Audrey's life that's available online. Uh, also just came out today, a wonderful interview with her, with Christiana Manpour that I'd encourage people to uh, to look at. And then um, uh, there are so many technologies that we need to build. I know many, you know, uh, listeners are in that community uh, the book describes uh, an order of magnitude more things than already exist, but many of them within near reach. So we would really welcome uh, entrepreneurship. We would welcome people to contribute to the book as they build those things so that there's documentation and ability to share and learn and scale uh, those practices. Uh, we would welcome people doing research on some of the infinite number of open questions that we describe in the book. Uh, we would welcome people financially supporting the communities. We would welcome people telling their friends about uh, the ideas. We welcome all kinds of cultural creation that both instantiate the idea of bridge building, instantiate some of the technology associated with it, and that tell the story of how that's all happening. Uh, so those are a few examples from the book, but there's many more. Yeah, I just uh, read um, a novel uh, by Amanda Scott uh, called Any Human Power, 
which is like a fictionalized version of whatever we just talk about the plurality ideas. And it's set uh, in a very immersive uh, world, uh, almost like, um, you know, Earthsea or something like that. Uh, and which I find will reach a audience, maybe teenage readers and so on, uh, that is quite apart from this podcast's readers. But this kind of cross-pollination between cultural products is exactly why we chose to public domain our work because we never can tell whether somebody remixed that into a hip-hop song or a rap or something like that. Cool. So where does the plurality community gather? Is there some sort of forum or Discord or Telegram groups? Or how, how do you all talk with each other? Well, uh, for the book, there's a, there's, a Discord, there's, a, there's a Discord group for the book. There's also a lot of people who are involved in radical exchange groups around the world. Um, there's Plurality Institute, which is more of an academic community. So there's many different uh, communities. But for the book, the Plurality Discord is a great one. Uh, and uh, where there's also a GitHub where people actually work on creating the book. Yeah, you can find all of this on Plurality.net. Perfect. Thank you both for coming on. It's been, it's been a true honor. Um, I wish you both the best for the rest of your book, too. I know you've been on the road for a very long time now. Um, so, uh, yeah, thank you so much, Frederick. Thank you. Live long and prosper. <laughs>